Good morning, Mountain Movers. Oh, thank God you're awake. All right, we are in week two. We're in part two of our current series, Summer Vacation, and we are reversing the curse of comparison because when summer comes, America goes on vacation. Everybody likes to do something when the weather gets warm. Maybe you like to go camping. Maybe I'm I don't. Do you like to camp? How many campers do we have in there? Does anybody like going camping? I remember this Does is a bonus involve story. Air conditioning. Somebody <laughs> in somebody in her I would need that. in her family decided it would be a good idea to go camping in the middle of July. Mm. All right. Now yeah. you might enjoy mosquitoes and 110 degree weather and humidity. And the fact during our monthly during our fast. monthly corporate fast, right? So we're starving and you can't sleep because we're miserable all night long. Wake up the next well, I say wake up. I mean we, we opened our we never really slept, but we opened our eyes and our senses to the smell of bacon on the black iron skillets. Bacon. They're making biscuits and scrambled eggs and this big, beautiful breakfast. It smelled so good. And we were fasting. And we hadn't slept all night. And we were miserable. And we were sweaty. And it was, it was, it was, it was rough. It was a little rough. How many of you guys like camping in the middle of July? Is that your thing? Okay. My point precisely. <laughs> Apparently, our family did our not family know when didn't you get should the go memo camping. That you shouldn't go camping in July. Right. So that, that was fun. But there's other things that people do. Maybe you like going to baseball games. Yeah. Maybe you, are you a Cardinals fan? Can I hear you if you're a yeah. Cardinals fan? Yeah. How about Royals fans? Do we have any Royals fans in the house? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. People like to go to Branson. They like to travel. People go to Destin. They go to Hawaii. I mean, people they like go on to the get lake. out. You know what's they crazy like is people actually come to our area to vacation. Does that not ever blow anybody else's mind? Like, we Did live here, and then I see other people on Facebook, and they say, we're going to Grand Lake. going to Grand Lake, lake. on like, vacation. I'm like, Woo! what? Really? <laughs> I live there. I little fun fact. Fun fact. It may have changed, but a couple of years ago, the stats said that in the summertime, Grove uh, adds about 30,000 people to the population because of visitors from the outside. That's crazy. So a lot of people like to spend their time on the water. The Heltons, we live on the lake, but we rarely ever see it. Because we're workaholics. And we yes, see we it. We help. just don't go out on it. Other than last Labor Day. We did. We did. And I think we have a picture. Uh, we did. We like to tube. Tyler and I. It's airborne. a little stretch. A little stretch. But Tyler and I were airborne. We got some massive. Dude, we got some air. Got some hang time. Yo, hang time. And we had, we had a good time in the water. Just trying to figure out any sort of, you know. Terms I can think of. But we had a really good time, and we like being on the water. Uh, but everybody, you know, summertime, everybody gets out, and they get about, and you don't have to look far, especially during the summer, to see what other people are doing that you're not doing, or places they're going that you've never been, and maybe you never will ever go. Uh, it, you don't have to look far. You can flip your way through social media, or you can look as close as next door, and you're going to see some things in other people's lives where you can begin, whether you want to or not, by human nature, we begin to compare ourselves and our lives to other people around us. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter what socioeconomic status you may have. I have known people in my life that have made so much money, seriously, massive money, and they still were driven. They were eaten up with envy over what other people had that had more money than them. It's crazy. I've learned in my life that it doesn't matter how wealthy you become, you can still be eaten up with envy and you can still compare yourself to somebody else who has a little bit more. It happens every day. And, and I think here's two things that, that happen. Here's two ways we respond when we when the pressure comes and today we're talking about the pressure to impress and what we're going to do with it is we're going to like deflate it we're going to def yeah bill i hit bill <laughs> if i could have hit any person in the crowd it would have been you bill i i mean that from the bottom of my heart i wish it would have just pummeled you in the face i i, I love bill you know but he mouths me all the time so there you go bill but I want to deflate. I want to... <laughs> Kipton's ready. He's like ready for me. We're going to deflate the pressure. Everybody say pressure. There's pressure all around us in our lives. 
anywhere you go, everywhere you look, there's pressure to impress. And I think we're going to respond one of two ways. We're either going to avoid the pressure and avoid embarrassment, right? Or we're going to pretend that we're someone we're not, right? We're going to put on something fake. We're going to try to impress people by being something we are or portraying that we have more than we really have, all right? And so today we're going to, there we go. Give me your best deflation sound. Let the air out and get rid of the pressure. It's all around us. You know, there's so many examples of the pressure that is externally put on us to not only impress, but just to keep up, if you will, with the Joneses. You've all heard that, right? Who are they anyway? I don't, I don't know. I don't even know any. I don't even know who the Joneses are. I don't even know are. any Joneses. But that's but everybody's the thing, keeping up with you know? Them. But, you know, if you have students that are in school, if you have kids, for us, the pressure really hit about the time they went into middle school. When they went into middle school, there was so much pressure on them that that pressure came home with them to us. And as a family, you have to set your priorities. You have to set your standards. You have to decide what's important to us. Because if not, you know what you'll end up doing is 10 years down the road, you'll look back and you'll be like, what have we been doing? Like, because we never set a standard, never set a goal. We never got to where we dreamed of being. And so for our family, we've lived on a budget. So that means that the family knows, like, there's X amount of dollars for everything that needs to happen in our life. Not because we can't afford something, but because we've decided what we wanted our future to look like. Well, for middle schoolers and high schoolers, that's like they don't the have dumbest the same. thing <laughs> it's like, that in is the so world. Stupid. Actually, one of them told me a while back, they said, you know, how about you guys wait to get out of debt until we are no longer living here? That would be awesome. And I'm like, well, it doesn't matter because you need to learn how to live on a budget now, yeah. too, because you keep running out of gas money and asking spend me for it. Less, you know what I'm saying? Spend less than you So are. a few years ago... One of them came in and said, hey, you know, basketball season starts in a few weeks. Like, I need new shoes. I'm like, that's fine. What do you want? And so he he tells me what he wants. I go to the mall. We go into all these different stores looking for a specific pair, okay? I snap some pics because that's just how I do it. I snap some pics, send it back to him. He was like, yeah, I like that pair right there. I'm like, great, 100 bucks. We got it. That's what we budgeted was 100. They came in at like like right above 100, like 105. Take him home. He loves them. He puts them on. He likes them. Nike Jordans, we're good to go. I'm thinking score. You know what I mean? Mom just like did good. He goes to practice the very next day, first day of practice, right? Can't believe it. Comes back home and he's like, not even bummed, just mad, like mad at me. And I'm like, what did I, I mean, what did you just, what, what did I do? You know what I'm saying? He was like, this is ridiculous, mom. I hate these shoes. These shoes Take them back. Shoes are horrible. Why? What, what happened? What's wrong with the shoes? Are they like, are they, are they not functioning the way they were created to function? Like what's wrong with them? He was like, they are last season's Jordans. I cannot believe that you would do that. You would buy me last season's Jordan. I'm like, what the heck? Seasons? I didn't even know that basketball shoes had have seasons. seasons. Like, that makes... I didn't see that. Why the did they have them on the shelf? Why are that? they even for sale exactly. if these are expired? I'm like... You can't wear them anymore. What are, they are no we good? talking about? I didn't know shoes expired. Do they so fit? We like get online and he's like showing me like these, these are this season. Are this season. I'm, I'm like, like, those are those? 215. Like... That is way beyond the budget. I said, now, if you want to spend your own money, I'm not going to, I'm not spending my money on it. Okay. Then you know what? Live in last seasons. You know what? It's not about impressing the other guys that are there. It's about what you wanted. You liked them. So wear them. Well, like you watch previous seasons of Hawaii Five-0. And you don't have a problem with it until you put shoes on and go to school. Now you want to be in this season. season. You like old seasons until you go to school. I don't get it. But there's so much pressure, and a lot of times as parents, if we're not careful, if we haven't predetermined, just FYI, before you go to the mall, how much you're going to spend at the mall, you get there, and all of a sudden, it's like all budget goes out the window, and you come home sick as a parent because you have blown the budget, you've used the the plastic that's in your wallet that you didn't really plan to use in that very moment. But you know what? There's other moments in your life. And as an adult, for us, it's just like, oh, that's ridiculous. You know what I mean? But I can think back to being there. But then there's these other moments where as an adult, you feel that same kind of pressure. Whether you want to 
deal with it or not, sometimes pressure finds you. Like when we went to Chicago as a family, my nephew was getting married, and we had the sweet minivan, and we crammed six of us in there. And yes, our family... uh, it's like it's like I don't I don't even know what to tell you. What happens when you put six kids in a or six kids? Well, or six I, of, okay. Four kids and two adults. <laughs> Misty Good says Lord. <laughs> five kids. Five kids and one adult. But you know what's funny about this? Okay, if you were around two years ago and you were that friends with was, us. Hold on, we were smiling. That was in the driveway. N- that's what I was gonna say. I was gonna say, you know what you do? You do the same thing I do. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, everybody selfie. So they're like, no, no mom. No, I'm like, so we are not stupid. leaving. And you're not eating all day. Give me all cell phones until I get a smiling selfie. Are we ready? Okay. Nope, that wasn't I good. I was eating. Delete. Do it again. Do it again until we get one where we look good. And we're like, yes. And four out of five ha- isn't bad. AJ's uh, hacked off. AJ's t- <laughs> At society. Maybe. Life in general. I just life. He's hacked. So we smile, then we snap at Chicago bound. Chicago. Here we go. All right, so you know what happens. That was the only I mean, time we smiled. When you do like, it was supposed to be 12 hours, ends up being 14 hours. And now we're running late. We don't have time to get to our hotel before we go to the hotel where the wedding is being held in downtown Chicago. And you know when you're on the road with family, they bring all sorts of extra stuff like pillows and blankets and movies and food and so it's like this bomb goes off inside the van and it's just it's it's trashed because you can find your family to this tiny space on four wheels and and so we we're sitting here running late like two hours over schedule and we realize we're gonna have to go straight to the hotel we're driving and now we haven't changed we are have the road film Right, not the film of the road, but like travel film. If you know what travel film is, it's like you're kind of just you feel icky because you've been in the car for 14 hours and you feel disgusting. And we're we're racing. We're we're, we've got the map and you know map and we got the map and we're and we're we're racing through downtown Chicago and we're getting really close. Like I can see our dot and I see the the pin and we're getting really close to the hotel. Then we disappear underground. How many of you guys knew that there was? Highways under Chicago. There are highways under all of the buildings, under all the streets, and you're going, it's like the Indy 500, and and it's like two lane, and you are zipping 90 to nothing. Everybody's friendly, though, because everybody was telling me I was number one. Everybody (laughs) was like, past, you are number one, you. And and here's what happens when you go underground. You lose cell signal. I was following the dot. I'm the dot. Now the dot no longer exists. <laughs> and we're going 90 to nothing, Indy 500, in the dark, like underground, you know, you know, fast and furious. And I'm seeing these lights flying by, these flashes of light. Those lights that are flashing by are these cargo-like uh, entrance doors where you enter under these skyscrapers in the parking garages under these buildings. And, but you're going so fast, you can't even read the sign to see what building that even was that you just passed going 90 miles an hour. So we drove around underground forever until we happened to see the hotel sign right above a garbage, a big dumpster on concrete. And we saw it, and somebody said, that's it. So, and I pull in, and remember, the van's trashed. We haven't changed. We're going straight to the hotel, which, by the way, I'll add, was probably... One of, not the nicest, if not the nicest hotel in Chicago, it was one of the nicest. This, the, the guys in tuxedos everywhere. We pull right in the parking garage, and and who knew it? In Chicago, there is no general parking like there is in Oklahoma. <laughs> you can't park at the end of the parking lot. In general Milwaukee. parking doesn't exist no. in Chicago, I guess, because we pulled right into valet. There was no other. There was no other options. We're right in. We are valet central. Guys in tuxedos, and I'm pulling up to these guys. And we have. I am sinking in my seat. Like, I am mortified. She's doing the whole. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed. And a really nice brand new Mercedes Benz pulls in right behind us. I'm feeling the pressure. Okay. They're in tuxes. They're asking for the keys. All of the suitcases and luggage is in the back. We need our clothes. We need to get everything out. We're in line. Okay. So. The left side door doesn't open, all right? The, the armrests on the chairs are all broken off, and the kids beat each other with them. <clears throat> we start unloading the van in front of the Mercedes, okay? We lift up the back hatch, which the hard, hydraulics went out like two years ago, so I have to hold the door open. 
while Misty. You can't make this stuff up. I'm not you making it up. Make this this stuff is real, up. guys. So Misty is is just like she's slinging clothes. She has the suitcases open. She's sing, slinging clothes. The kids are getting out. They're fighting, and I'm like, what are they fighting? Stop fighting! I'm gonna deal with you when we get back to Oklahoma. All right. So so she's throwing clothes, and the valet guys are standing there, and the Mercedes person is right behind us. We are feeling the pressure. And we have to get all of our clothes so we can go inside and go to the bathroom to change and throw some water in our face and freshen up just to go right into the wedding on the top level. Pressure. It was horrible, horrible, horrible pressure. All around us, there was pressure. Pressure to impress. I love what Eleanor Roosevelt said. She says this, you wouldn't worry so much about what others think of you if you realized how seldom they do. And, you know, as I reflect and I think back about that day and everything that happened that day, those valet guys, they didn't care. I'm sure they got a laugh. (laughs) I'm sure they thought it was hilarious watching this Oklahoma family, right, throwing clothes and yelling at each other. And and Pastor Brad with his Christian cussing, he was like, what the flaming son of a biscuit eater? Get in the hotel. I mean, I'm, I'm going berserk here. I'm going berserk, guys. I'm sure they got a laugh, but guess what? They didn't care. They didn't care about my sweet minivan with the hydraulics broken. They didn't care about the door that wouldn't open. They didn't care about the armrests that were broken. They didn't care. The Mercedes guy, he didn't care. People don't care. We think people care about our stuff and what we have and where we've been and what we're doing. People don't care. Yet we allow ourselves to feel the pressure to impress other people. At the end of the day, we can't cave to the pressure. That's right. And, you know, just this week, we actually said goodbye to that sweet minivan. We did. And it was actually really very sad. I was it has nothing have a to do with the message. This morning, but when we made the decision, like, okay, it's, you know, it's gone. Honestly, Mia was like, are we sure we want to do this? I mean, I'm like, I know. Are we sure we want to do this? It's really comfortable. It's very broken. We're very used to that getting is a out. Good phrase. We're getting used Broke to in. the right side door working and not the left. I mean, it's very fun. And it's been a fun piece of every message for years and years, the sweet minivan. But it is no more. No more. It is gone no. at this point. But you know what? It's crazy because in those moments of pressure, all we could think about is, I cannot believe we drove to Chicago <laughs> in this old minivan. And not only that, like we're not ex- expecting anybody would see us, especially all these people at this fancy hotel. And then you're just thinking, I just want to like, I want to just disappear and go home and buy a brand new car like everybody else. Because in Chicago, we didn't see anybody in an older vehicle. But here's what's interesting. On our way home, as we got to thinking about it, we were like, you know what? Who cares? At the end of the day, really, who cares? When you set your standard and you decide, you know what? What God has laid on our heart to do, God told us to come to Oklahoma. God told us to plant a church. God told us to get out of debt. We were doing exactly the plan that we felt like God had directed us on. We weren't going to cave in the pressure. This morning, I want to tell you a story about King David from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 is where I'm going to start. And King David had this also a moment where in his family, there was massive pressure for him to just cave, but he didn't to cave. impress the people cave. around him, but he didn't cave. It's a very cool story. I want you to look at it. We're going to start in verse 12. It says this, then King David was told, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because of the ark of God. Now, let's pause for a second. What is the Ark of God? David is king over Israel, all right? The Ark of God was the center of their worship. It literally represented God's presence because in that day and time, they, would ha- they had the tabernacle or the tent, and the Ark would be in the tent in the Holy of Holies, and it literally represented God's presence for the people. Well, the Ark had been captured 70 years earlier. So before King David was actually on the throne and had been captured, it hadn't been in Israel for 70 years. So it's a really exciting moment that they're bringing it back to the city of David. So David went there, and he brought back the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David, and that's Jerusalem. So that's the capital city of Israel. Verse 16, but as the Ark of God was entering the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out her window. Now, pause. Who's this girl? She's King Saul's daughter. King Saul was on the throne before David, and he gave his daughter to David as a wife. 
So it's interesting in this entire passage, you do not see her being known as David's wife, although she was. This says she was King Saul's daughter. That tells us something really important. Her status mattered a whole lot to her. She would rather have been known as King Saul's daughter than David's wife in this moment. Now, let's pick it up. It says this. She looks down from her window when she sees King David, her husband, leaping and dancing before the Lord. She was filled with contempt for him. In this moment, she's embarrassed because he's not acting like a royal. You ever seen any of the, like, princess diaries? And there was a recent one that my girls were watching the other day, and I was dying because this girl comes from America. She goes to London. She realizes she's royal. And when she gets there, she doesn't know how to act like a royal. She just acts like a teenage girl from the States. And everybody is just like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I cannot believe she's acting like that. Girls don't act like that. And she wasn't doing anything bad. She was just having fun. But the fact, like, she got on a motorcycle and took off, you know, and it's like you just don't do that if you're royal. Well, that's what Michael was saying. You, What are you doing? You're dancing before the Lord in front of people. You're making a fool out of yourself. Verse 17, they brought the ark of the Lord and they set it in its place there in the tent. David had prepared for it. And David brought sacrifices and peace offerings to the Lord. When he had finished the sacrifices, David blessed the people in the name of the Lord of heaven's army. Then he gave to all the Israelite men and women, the crowd, he gave them bread and dates and cakes, and he gave them all kinds of food. He was blessing them all. Then verse 20, it says this. Now, when David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. Now, just imagine how this is going to go. Hagatha. Right? Hagatha is on the scene. Don't elbow your spouse in this moment, all right? She says in disgust how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to all the servant girls like a vulgar person might do. Now, listen. If you've been in church any time in your life, you may think that what David was doing was dancing in his underwear because there are some theologians that believe that based on the text. But when you really study it, what he was in was commoner's clothes. So it would be like he showed up coming into the city of David, the capital city where the throne was, and he was in normal street clothes rather than his royal robes and crown. Now, status mattered to her. She was always comparing herself to everybody else. She wanted to make sure everybody knew, this is where I rank. But because David didn't care what everybody else thought, David wasn't concerned what the people thought. David was concerned about what God thought. And in those moments as he's coming in, he's not worried about the people. He's thinking, I'm celebrating the fact that for 70 years, the presence of God has been absent from our nation, but we're bringing it home today. And in his mind, he's thinking, I don't know why everybody is not celebrating when God's presence is arriving back in the capital city, but because Michael was more concerned about what people thought than what God thought, look at what happens. Go down to verse 23, and it says this. Michael, again, it doesn't say David's wife. It says the daughter of Saul. She remained childless throughout her entire life. God allowed her to be barren from that point forward. Consequences for her poor choices in that moment of giving in to the curse of comparison. And guys, it's so easy in our life. It's so easy when the pressure of family The pressure from a spouse, the pressure from a kid, the pressure from your friends begins to push in on you that you begin to make a decision that may go against a standard you had already set. I remember being in college many times in college when Brad and I would be invited to go out to dinner. It seemed like people went out to eat after everything, after ball games, after church service, after everything. And we had very little money set aside for eating out. But you know how many times we caved? How many times? Tons. And you couldn't even enjoy the meal because all I'm thinking about is like something else is going to have to go this week because we just made this choice right here. Because rather than just looking at somebody and say, hey, that's not in our budget, which nobody says that. Like, you know what I mean? You think, oh, they'll think I'm poor. No, it wasn't that what it was poor. Is that we wanted to actually pay the house payment rather than go out to dinner tonight. You know what I'm saying? But in that moment, you cave. David didn't cave. And guys, as you begin to experience the external pressures, parents, the best thing you could do is teach your kids to not cave under pressure. 
The pressure that your kids are going to face in middle school and high school, shoes are the least of your worries. You need to learn how to set standards and learn how to set priorities based on the word of God and say, don't cave to the pressure. And as mom and dad, if every time they put pressure on you, you cave, what kind of standard are you setting for them? It's like, oh, when the pressure is on, we all cave because that's even what mom and dad does. You've got to learn how to stand up even in your own home. And let me just tell you the way that you do it is you sit down as a family and you discuss, these are the values that we have. These are the standards and our priorities. Even in this season, this is our priority. So that when the pressure is on, everybody's on the same page. Don't be that person. Don't be like Michael. Don't be, don't be like Saul's daughter. Don't be that person that puts pressure on someone else to impress. Don't, don't be that child that puts the pressure on your parents, students. Don't, don't be that spouse that puts pressure on the other spouse. Don't be that friend that puts pressure on a friend. Why? Because it is selfish. When we put pressure on others like that, we're only thinking about ourselves and how we're going to look and the impact it's going to have on our reputation and the way people view us, the way people think about us. It's selfish. Philippians 2 and 3 says, don't be selfish. Look at somebody. I know you may not know them. Just say, don't be selfish. Don't be selfish. Listen to this next part. Don't try to impress others. The two are synonymous. When we try to impress other people, we are being selfish. When we put pressure on those we love, we are being selfish. I know of a king uh, that it, it, we talk about this guy in, in Esther chapter 1. His name is Xerxes, King Xerxes. But I'm going to call him King Jerxes because he was a royal jerk. The guy was so selfish. I mean, like, you look up selfish and you've got King Jerxes right there because he, he wanted to host this huge party, like probably the party of all parties of all time kind of party. This party, he invited, he, had, he was over 127 provinces in old Persia. All right, he was over 127 provinces. He invited all of the officials, all of the military leaders, all of the princes, all of the nobles. He invited everybody of, of any importance. He invited them to come out to this party. And guess how long this party lasted that he hosted? 180 days. 180 days. I've never been to spring break. I know... I know uh, at spring break, a lot of people like to go to different places, and they're there for like a week, right? And horrible things happen that you don't ever want to repeat to your kids when you get older. I know memories are made that are horrible. I know things happen. But this was only for a week. Spring break is only a week. This party was for 180 days. 180 days. He invites everybody out, and man, he puts on a show. He brings out the gold goblets. He has an open bar, just people drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking. And, and, and he brought out all of the, these, these ribbons and these decorations and the gold and the silver. He wanted to impress everybody from all around. Man, he was really putting on the show. And when that party was over, you want to know what he did? He had another party for seven days with just the officials, all right? Just them for seven days days he had another party and 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 when he was at his best quote unquote let's look at what happens in verse 10 it says on the seventh day of the feast when king jerxes was in high spirits all right the dude was hammered he was hammered on his rear end and 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 how many of you guys know when people get hammered, especially rednecks, they say and do really stupid things. Listen, he says, because of the wine, it says, he told the seven eunuchs who attended him to bring his queen, Queen Vashti, to him with the royal crown on her head. This was his request. What's interesting about this request is that he was asking for his queen to come out to him in front of everybody wearing only her royal he wanted to display to everybody how beautiful his wife was. But look how Queen Vashti responds. When they send for her, when they send for her, Queen Vashti, she, it says that she refused to come. Go, girl. Go, you, right? Way to stand up to the king. This made the king so furious, it says that he burned with anger. Then he gathered all of his counselors together, all right? And he's like, what do we do? What do we do? I mean, I asked her to come out to me. You know, he's hammered. He's being stupid. 
And he, he says, I asked her to come out to me. She won't come out to me. So what do we do with her? So they, have, they get all political, and they establish this royal decree, a law to all the Persians and all the Medes. I'm like, okay, you're really making a big deal out of this. And it's, a, it's one of these laws that cannot be revoked. It said, it should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished. That means removing her royal position as queen, never to be in the king's presence again. But a lot, of, a lot of scholars believe what it also meant was the death of her. It meant that she would be executed. King Xerxes, the king, executes his wife because she wouldn't come out. Why? Because he wanted selfishly to impress everybody with what he had and what they didn't. When we when we cave to the pressure to impress other people, listen to me, man, we do some stupid, stupid, stupid things, right? Don't put pressure to impress on the ones you love because you want to be loved by others, all right? And surround yourself with people who are going to love you, not for what you have, but for who you are. Not for what you have. Don't. If you have people in your lives that they love you because of what you have or, or, or things you've done or, 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 or your status or, or, or your money, any of that, man, ditch them. You don't need friends like that, right? You need to surround your peop- yourself with people that are just going to love you for who you are, right? You don't need to surround yourself with people like that. Romans 12 and 2 says this. It says, don't be conformed. Say conformed. Don't be conformed. Don't be conformed to this world. See, there's a mold that society makes for you and I, how we should look, how we should dress, cars we should drive, houses we should live in, places we should vacation, right? The world has a mold. And so many times when we, when we, when we get caught up in that curse of comparison, we try to fit ourselves into the mold that society or social media says that we should live by. But Scripture says that we shouldn't conform to this way of thinking, but we should be renewed by our minds so that we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we may be able to determine what God's will is for us, what is proper, pleasing, and perfect. At the end of the day, guys, here's what real success is. It's obedience to God. Nothing more and nothing less. We shouldn't concern ourselves with pleasing other people at all. Instead, we should, we should, we should, like King David, all he wanted to do was please God. That's all he wanted at the end of the day was to make God happy. Success, real success in your life has nothing to do with the money you make or the title you have or the car you drive or the house you live in. It doesn't have to do with your accomplishments. It has to do with pleasing God, with being obedient to Almighty God. We are bondservants of the Lord Most High. We belong to Him. You were created in God's image. And He has a plan that you would walk out this life, that you would fit the mold. Say mold. That you would fit the mold that He has for your life. I want to ask you a question. Are you living in that mold right now? Are you hearing me? I feel like I'm talking to my kids. I want to grab everybody by the ear. Are you listening Cause, and i got to grab myself by the ears. Are we hearing what the Lord says today? Do you Scale yourself right now from 1 to 10. 1 being the least, 10 being the greatest. How much are you living according to the mold that God has set for you? How much are you pleasing God with the life that you're living, the person you are? Think about it. How much do you strive to do what God wants you to do and be who he wants you to be? How often do you honestly think about that? How honestly do you think about the real meaning of success? God, I want to be obedient to you because one day you're going to stop breathing. And we talked about this in the last series, that rope that goes for miles and miles. And, and we look at that rope and we're like, man, eternity is a long time. And we look at the end of that rope and realize this life that we're living on this earth is so short. You're not going to be so concerned about this life you're living right now and your accomplishments, and your cars, and all those things, when you breathe your last breath, and you're immediately in the presence of God, and he says, did you serve me? Did you obey me? Did you live for me? Did you do what I told you to do? Were you the person I called you to be? Did you fit the mold? Did you cave to the pressure to impress other people, or did you, were you driven to impress me in everything you did? Come on. That's what God wants. That's what he wants from you. I want you to survey your life today. As you leave today, my prayer is that God will just bug you to death. And he will just talk to you about your life and have you to survey your life and look at your life and, and, and measure. Measure up. 
God, how do you want me to live so that I can fit this mold that you have for me instead of the mold that everybody else has for me? We're going to deflate the pressure to impress. Will you do it? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would help us to see ourselves the way you see us. I pray that we wouldn't be driven by any pressures from this world that we experience to impress or please anybody. God, don't let us be people pleasers. Let us be God pleasers. Let us do everything in our heart, God, driven by pleasing you and being obedient to you, God, and to you alone. Reverse the curse of comparison in our lives, God. At the end of the day, we know, really, they don't care anyway, but you do care. And we want to please you today. With heads bowed and eyes closed, are you in this house? Or maybe you're watching online. And you've asked yourself, am I I really right with God? If God were to ask you right now, why should I let you in my heaven? What would you tell him? I'm a good person. I've read the Bible. I I pray. None of those answers are going to get you into heaven. None of those. I go to church every Sunday. That answer is not going to get you to heaven. What God wants to know from you is do you have a real and life-changing relationship with him? Not religion. Do you have a relationship with him? Do you love him with all your heart? I'd encourage you today to make the decision I made many years ago. Admit that you have fallen short. You've made so many mistakes that fall short of God's standard. Ask him to forgive you. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Confess Him as Lord of your life and begin living for Him today. Would you do that with heads bowed, eyes closed? If you're watching online, if you want to make that decision, just type I'm all in in the comment section below. If you're in this house and you want to make that decision, we want to pray with you as a church family. So would you just raise your hand in this house this morning and we'll pray with you. Amen. Come on. Anybody else? Come on. Amen. Sweet Holy Spirit, do your work today. Thank you, Father. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. Amen. Church, let's pray this prayer together. Father, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. Jesus is the Son of God. I confess him as Lord of my life. Deflate the pressure to impress others. Help me to please you in everything I do. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you just made that decision today, I want to tell you, we want to celebrate with you by giving you a gift. It's called our Next Step Kit. You can pick it up on the left as you exit today. And if you're online, just message us your address and we'll pop one in the mail to you in the morning. We want to make sure you're successful on this journey because this is the most important thing you will ever do in your life. We put your hands together this morning for all of those who just made that decision. Thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.